I want you to know here is the schedule as uh, Mark has approved it for our next three weeks together. Uh, we will be meeting in here with uh, Peter Lilback, uh, president of Westminster Theological Seminary, who again is uh, visiting with us and teaching us. And then, of course, there is Easter weekend and there is no Bible study uh, or Sunday school class for that particular weekend. And then the following week, and I want to punctuate this, uh, my dear friend from Oklahoma City, uh, Jay Bruce, will be here and he is going to put together or has put together a wonderful talk and a presentation of pictures uh, as he went to Glasgow and attended the uh, funeral service of Eric Alexander. I heard his presentation Friday morning and it was very, very powerful. And I hope you would avail yourself of the opportunity to hear Jay, dear friend, great man of God, and uh, he has uh, a very impactful ministry all over the world. He sits on the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. He lost a son uh, from birth defects. That son struggled for his life for close to two months. We were in daily prayer for him. God took him. And what did Jay do? Get in a corner and feel sorry for himself? No, he built a monument to it. He wrote a book, and that book has been published, and I think it's on its second or third publication, about Christians that lose children. And it's been used mightily of the Lord. So uh, you will really enjoy him, a great, great friend of Believer's Chapel, knows Mark, knows Dan well, and uh, we look forward to that. Okay, uh, I have to tell you, before I even begin the study today, that I come to you a little bit angry. Uh, probably not a little bit, probably a little more than a little bit angry. Um, I, so much so that I want to st step outside and scream in a loud voice, how dare you? Um, I'm quoting now from the Washington Examiner. Swedish environmentalist activist Greta Thornburg will be confirmed an honorary doctorate from the Finnish University in, of theology. Uh, you know, they could have called Dan. Um, they could have called Mark. Uh, I sit by the phone every day. I really didn't care that she was made young woman Time Magazine of the Year or that she spoke at the United Nations but these ironies of her being put into a doctorate of theology, I could not let pass. Um, she stepped into the world of theology in uh, 2018 when she predicted that by 2023, fossil fuels will have destroyed civilization. Now, I know I need to be gracious. We still have time here in 2023. But I don't think I'm going to grant her the kindness and compassion of saying, Greta, you're no prophetess. Um, not going to happen. And uh, they, she has now taken that prediction down from her website, by the way. But here's the second irony. The theology that she has 
purported to be involved in. Uh, she says that the world is going to be destroyed by fossil fuels when the Word of God itself, pick it up and read it, Greta, 2 Peter 3, 7, it's going to be destroyed by fire, not by fossil fuels. But you see, what they have done with theology, which is the queen of the sciences, they have reduced theology to addressing social ills. I mean, if you really care, why aren't you out there protesting? If you really care about people, you should be on the front lines. We're not called to clean up the social ills of life. Jesus put it that way. The poor you're always going to have with you. Uh, we are not here to clean up the environment. We are here to proclaim the Scriptures. And we are to live a godly life, of which the book of Proverbs gives us ample illustration for doing so. No, it is paramount that we have the knowledge of God. John Calvin he opens the institutes with the profoundest of thought. All knowledge that we possessed, good and true knowledge, consists in two parts. The knowledge of God, and then the knowledge of ourselves. It's the study of God and our relationship to Him. That's what Calvin says we should be about. Now, the liberals, they love Jesus. They hate the apostles. They hate the apostles because they say the apostles are really not adequate, full-throated interpreters of the Lord Jesus. I will grant my liberal friends their premise. Don't believe it, but I'll grant it to them. Okay? Let's listen to what the Lord Jesus said. The Lord Jesus that you say is far above the apostles. Here it is. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29. Come unto me, all ye who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, me, he is the object of our knowledge. He is the central focus of our understanding. You say he is superior to any other scripture. I don't believe that, but I'll grant that to you. But he said, learn of me. Don't clean up the social ills of the world. We're not interested in that. We're interested in proclaiming a truth and walking in it. That's what we're about. And uh, that's what Believer's Chapel is all about. I've actually had someone sit across from me at dinner and say, love Believer's Chapel, uh, and grew at Believer's Chapel, but Believer's Chapel is inadequate for worship. Now, he said that to the wrong person. Because here's my response How do I know how to worship? How do I know how to be a father? How do I know how to raise my children? How do I know how to be a friend? How do I know how to love people? I have to go to the Scriptures. Now, don't get me wrong. I love pipe organs. And I love candlelight. 
And I love beautiful auditoriums. If you're ever in Tulsa, Oklahoma, go to First Presbyterian Church in Tulsa. That is a beautiful auditorium. Spectacular. But those things, my friends, do not sanctify. Here is sanctification. You say Jesus, okay, I'll give you Jesus. Here He is. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by Thy Word. Thy Word is truth. Not organ music, not choirs. I like them. I love them. But they do not sanctify. What sanctifies? It is Holy Scripture. I love my friends and appreciate them, but they're dead wrong. I cannot learn to worship until I study the Scriptures. And when we come to the meeting of the church, what do we have? We have our elders stand up and remind us. They remind us of the instruction of what? Their thoughts? Their best feelings? No. This is what the Scriptures say. And remind us of that. We know nothing without the Word of God. Now, I don't know what you thought about any of that, but I've taken a cleansing breath and I feel so much better. I'm not angry anymore. We're in Proverbs chapter 28. And... Uh, we're studying these Proverbs together and we're going to try to get through the 20, uh, 28th chapter and on to 29 this morning. Here's our first. It is 2827. I would ask you also uh, to set a tab at Job 18 before we read here. Job 18. I don't know when you've had your last reading of the book of Job, but we're going to look at chapter 18 and a few verses this morning because I think they will add to our instruction. All right, Proverbs 28, 27. As for the one who gives to the poor, there is no, you may have lack, or that's the word, or want, but the one that shuts his eyes has many curses. Now, 29.1. As for the person uh, often rebuked who hardens his neck, in an instant will, it will be broken without remedy. Without remedy. Wow. That is frightening. The fear of the Lord, my friends, is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, five, we're going to skip now to five. And the reason I'm skipping is because we've either covered similar Proverbs with the same theme, or uh, we're going to uh, pick ones that are particularly difficult. And I've got a few for us this morning that we need to attend with detail. Uh, so here's five, and this is a hard one. A man who flatters his neighbor is one who spreads a net for his feet. You wouldn't think that'd be hard. It's very difficult. Here's six. Uh, in the transgression of an evil person is a snare, but the righteous person shouts for joy and is glad. Here's seven. A righteous person who you may have consider, it is the word to know, but it is not knowledge necessarily, but it's inward thought. It is processing. I think that would be the better idea. The righteous person who processes, 
court decisions. That would be gates at the that would be the ancient gates of the city uh, for the poor. Now, when you have the word poor in the in the Hebrew language, it's one in the same as weak, and I'm going to show you how that word is used. So think of poor as weak, weak as poor, one in the same. Uh, and so in the transgression of an evil person, uh, verse 6 is a snare, but the righteous person shouts for joy and is glad. And 7, uh, a righteous person who uh, considers court decisions for the poor, but, the, but a wicked person does not understand such concern or knowledge. Once again, it's a different word than knows in line one, and I will go through that with you. Verse eight, mockers cause a city to pour forth anger. Why did I pick this one? Why, that's not relevant at all anymore, is it? Uh, to our day and time. Look at what's happening in our cities. Look what the Proverbs say. Mockers cause a city to pour forth anger, but the wise turn back anger. And then 11, a fool gives full vent to his rage, but a wise person stills it. Okay, well, let's begin 28, 27. You want to be wise? You want to have the skill for living? Well, serve the weak. Serve the weak. The poor. It is acts of kindness that is tied to the promise here. We have a, a proverb with a promise. No lack. Um, implying that God is out there in your future always, wherever you are, to take care of you. Look at this top line. Grammatically, it is the giver who has no lack. You see that. Um, line two, the one who shuts his, his ears to the weak, the poor, he's going to inherit many curses. We open the top line with a identification trait of the believer. And here it is. The believer is a giver. In a world of takers, who is the believer? He's a giver. Um, he serves others. Time, attention, energy, resources, whatever they may be. And here it is identified. It's to the weak. It's to the poor. And by that practice, the promise of the Word of God, you will always have a ready supply in the future. That's Jesus' promise. Because, as He said, the poor is always with us. So we're going to have an abundant supply for ministry always in the future. The most miserable people in life are the self-centered, selfish they are devoted entirely to themselves in indulgence. But the powerful promise, look at this, no lack, implying that God brought you out of death into life to make sure that you have a ministry. He's given you something to do. And here it is. Take care of the weak. And for that, there will be no shortage. Here's how the Lord Jesus put it. The liberals, Lord Jesus. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Give, He said, that's a command. Give and it'll be given to you. Press down, good measure, running over. It'll be put in your lap. Now, if you didn't understand what He just said, He's going to say it again in a different way. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So, you want abundance? He'll give it to you. Are you abundant in your time, energy, effort for the weak? Look at the contrast here. But the wicked, line two, 
They shut their eyes. What is that, shutting your eyes? I've thought about that. Luke 16, you remember the man covered in purple? He stepped over Lazarus or he stepped around him, but he knew him enough to remember his name because he calls upon Father Abraham to have Lazarus bring one drop of water for his tongue. He remembered him. Um, now, the, pro the proverb before us is a warning. This is how you should live. You want to be wise? This is how you should do it. There's going to be a reckoning. And this reckoning speaks directly to a man. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So here it is, our proverb. And it is loaded with consequences. Here are the consequences. Hearing the Word of God. And hearing His correction. Our top lines, rebuke, reprove, correct. And here is something very subtle. Notice it is correction often. It's in the plural. It's repeated. It's corrections. Uh, you harden your neck. You become obstinate to the Word. You're defying authority over and over again by your life. Um, the Lord, in uh, speaking to Moses, Exodus 32.9, He said, I have seen that these people are stiff-necked, and it's the imagery of an animal that resists the yoke, seeking to be placed upon him. Look at the predicate. Look at the consequences. It's a sudden, a sudden shattering. The proverb calls it instant, broken. That's what happens when you don't hear the Word of God or respond to it. This is the Scriptures. Immediate, effective, and complete. I remind you, Genesis chapter 7, verse 16, when all the animals were put in the ark, it is God alone who shut the door of the ark. That's what the proverb is saying. There is just so much revelation that's going to be given to men. They're given to it naturally by the creation. They're given specially by the Scriptures. You keep ignoring it, and there will become a day and a time when you cannot recome back. That's what the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 6. So what's our lifestyle? Our lifestyle? Well, it's one of graciousness and giving. It is one of heeding what the Word of God says. And those are the Proverbs. Now, I go to verse 5. This is a very difficult proverb. It was a surprise to me. You see, there's a difference between flattery and encouragement. Encouragement has the knowledge of the person and the circumstance of the person. And it's based always upon truth. Flattery hypes the person, but does not help the person. Harms them, really. Notice the imagery in the proverb. It is the hunter's trapping of a wild animal. The means to gain the advantage over the individual. He wants to take advantage to plunder one way or the other. His scheme is to plunder. And notice who he's plundering. It's the neighbor. So style-wise, we notice that it is one single sentence proverb tied together by the word one which is a comparison. The flatterer is the, hunt of the hunter, which is significant because the word man in the proverb is not the ordinary word for man that you see often in the proverbs. The ordinary word for man is dirt, ground. 
It is from the dirt, from the ground that He made the man. And that was the Word. But that's not this Word. This Word is used of mighty Nimrod. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 9. Nimrod was a mighty hunter. But more than that, he had an incredible talent and ability which gives us insight into the proverb. He was able to convince all of these people to build that big zuggernaut. He is a man of power and influence. That's this man. That's how gifted he is. That's Adolf Hitler. Speaking to people with his tongue and getting them to do what he wanted them to do. You ever studied the life of the drug lord from Colombia, Pablo Escobar? It's what he did. He appealed to people and got them to do his bidding. You see it every day. It's with all cult leaders everywhere. So his tool is the tongue. And... What happens is the net. The tongue here is the flatterer. It's the word smooth. We saw it back in Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 5, used of the, the adulteress, the seductress. She used her words to influence the man. Now notice the neighbor. No personal relationship here. This is... A man on the street. That's the neighbor walking down the street. And what's he do? He goes, man, that guy is so powerful. He is so persuasive. I'm going to join whatever he has us to do. It's a first impression. Now, what do we learn from the book of Proverbs? Proverbs teaches us very clearly that wisdom, truth, is discovered over a protracted period of time. We don't just listen to somebody. We watch somebody. Their behavior has to match their mouth. And that takes time. We want to watch them closely. Now, Look at this verb spread. It gives us the predicate, the consequence. The net for the neighbor. The net for the neighbor. We've seen that net before. That's Proverbs 1.17. It's what you use to trap the bird, the wild animal. And where is it trapping the man? Well, there it is. The feet. Literally, his steps. In order to trip him up. I say to you men in business, study the Scriptures. Men are out there to trick you, to trap you, to take advantage of you. Uh, I visited with a young man this week. He got a threatening letter. Cease and desist. He had done nothing wrong. Men want to intimidate you. He was a believer. He came to me. Here's what you do. Psalm 119.105 Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So stay in the Scriptures. Keep praying. It will lead you. It will guide you. Now, here is the difficulty in the proverb. You wouldn't think it was difficult, but it is. You don't pick it up to the end. Here's the question. Who is the his in the proverb at the end? Is it the innocent neighbor? Or is it the end result of the wicked man and what he is trying to do? The flatterer. You wouldn't think so by reading the text for the first time. But when you do a comparative study using these words, you come to a different conclusion. That's why I wanted you to take a look at Job 
chapter 18. So hold your spot right here in the proverb. Turn over to Job 18, and I want you to look at verses 7 through 10. He's describing the wicked man, the strong man, the mighty man. His strong steps are shortened, and his own, look at that word, schemes. That's Proverbs 24, 8. He who plots schemes is wickedness. Throws him down. For he is cast into the net, look at that, of his own feet. And he walks on its mesh. Look at this. A trap seizes him. Seizes him by the heel. A snare lays hold of him. A rope is hidden for him in the ground. A trap for him in the path. Now, who is the his at the end of the proverb? Well, grammatically, it's, it is ambiguous. It could be the innocent neighbor teaching us again to walk with wise and you'll be wise. That's Proverbs 13.20. Or it could be the man who was calculating and was trying to trap and trick and lie and scheme and steal. Proverbs 26, 27, we had it not too long ago. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. Whoever rolls a stone, it's going to be rolled back on him. Why is he so certain in the Proverbs? Because this is the way God made the universe. It's all by wisdom. Everything is by wisdom. Wicked Haman and Esther became close friend of the king. Place of power, authority, advancing his career. Now he's got gravitas. He hated Mordecai, the Jewish guard out there in the front, away from the palace. He had gallows built for Mordecai. But in the providence of God, <laughs> that which was built for his enemy, he ended up on himself. The stone rolled back. On him, wicked Haman. I think verse 6, we could actually say, helps us with our difficult interpretation of verse 5. Look at this. Uh, the imagery here, the two proverbs are linked. The interpretive question of the previous proverb, his, is that the wicked fool? Who thought he was getting away with everything that he wanted. Setting traps, tricking, lying, stealing. Welcome to the business world. But in the providence of God, guess what? He gets something entirely different. Our top line opens with three key terms. First, transgression, familiar word in our proverb studies. A rebellion. A hostility between persons or states. A personal crime. Only the Lord, by His grace and mercy, under the law, can remove a transgression. It's set in concrete. There it is. Here's the second term. The evil man, who by lifestyle forsakes God. Psalm 10, verse 4, In all of his thoughts, there is no room for God. No, he's a, a man on his own. God doesn't exist. Verse, uh, Psalm 14, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's this man, evil man. Here's the third term, snare, the trap. Contrasted in line 2 with shouts of joy. See that? The raised voice, the spontaneous loud cry. It is what Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20 told us that wisdom did in the streets. Shout it out. Come, listen to me. I'm going to give you life 
and I'm going to give it to you abundantly. That's this word. For all people to hear, if people will listen. But now look at the righteous man's behavior. What's his behavior? Day to day. He disadvantages himself to advantage others. That's what he does. And that's his way. And he has no fear. He has no fear of the future. That's the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. It says she has no fear of the future. Why? Because of her confidence in the living God. We have no fears in the future. Our God is our protector, our shield, and defender. And here are the consequences of living that kind of life. Look at the word, glad. You see that? That is gladness despite your providence. You know how I know that? It's the same word that Moses uses in Psalm 90 and verse 15. Here's his petition. Make us glad for as many years as we have seen trouble, death, and evil. You know what glad is? Glad is supernatural. That's what glad is. It's the supernatural. I used to get up to the, wake up every morning in the 90s to the clock radio, and I was all, the first program of the morning was always James Dobson, Focus on the Family. And I can remember this one program very vividly. It was a, a younger guy speaking. He was, a, he was on staff for Campus Crusade for Christ. A wife and two little boys. And the Christmas season and the New Year rolled around and it was late winter, early spring, like this time. And suddenly his wife got ill. Quickly. She was gone. Now he's on a college campus. He's got two little boys. And he said after, uh, after the family and the friends all left after about ten days, we settled into a brand new providence. It was me and the two boys. And invariably, two weeks went by. And in the middle of the night, one comes in crying. He's gotten sick. Well... Dads, we all know, don't we? We fluff that pillow up, roll over. That's mom's job, right? But there's no mom. No mom. So he gets his pajamas off. He gets him in the shower. He cleans him up. He puts new pajamas on and then gets his mop. And he, oh, my heart's going out to this guy. And he said, I set to the task of the bathroom. And then he said this, in the midst of moving that mop, I suddenly, like a rain shower that comes over you, I was loaded with joy and gladness and peace. Peace like a river when sorrowful providential winds blow. He said, I can't explain it. I couldn't either, listening to him, but I was riveted to his testimony. It came upon this word glad. That is supernatural. That is the Lord Jesus coming to you Rich, Tory, the Newmans, putting his arm around you. He's there. You're right on target. This is God's plan and purpose. And He's going to get you through just like He's going to get all of us through. Here's seven. We're running out of time. A righteous person who knows. It's a different word 
than the last word knowing. Our top line opens with righteous, contrasted to the wicked, line two. Look at this, knows. You may have care, considers, concerns, and that's balanced in line two with understanding. The King James says regard. The Proverbs teach over and over again, we should stay concerned for others at all times. Jesus Christ has regenerated you from death to life that you might glorify Him. And that means to get out of yourself and into others' life. And you flow naturally to them. And so here it is, the opening, the righteous know. He involves Himself with others' concerns. So wisdom here bears people. Wisdom here cares for people. The burdens for others. That is our calling. That's not the calling of a professional church staff. No, that's your calling. That's your calling. You're a believer priest. Read the Scriptures. That's my calling. Your calling. We care for others. Their needs. Where they are. Their burdens. We pray for them. Over and over. This word poor now. Weak, poor. I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to give it to you, and you'll never forget it. It's Genesis chapter 41, 19. You know how it's used? You'll never forget it. It's used of the gaunt cow that came up out of the Nile in Pharaoh's dream. That's the word. Line two. Look at your contrast. The wicked here. They have total disregard for others' interest. They're only interested in themselves. And the righteous, they care. They care in their concern because that is the way the Lord has made them all. And so, you and I show compassion, time, energy, resources. That's the Good Samaritan. There he is. That's the example. He's not the extreme. He is the normal. Are you being normal? My friends, you and I are the kingdom of God. I believe that the Scriptures teach that one day Jesus Christ Himself bodily will sit upon the throne of David in Jerusalem and rule the world. That day is not here. It's not. It's not to be seen. You walk outside this building, people don't care. Where's the kingdom? It's here. It's right here. It's among us. How did Paul put it? We're just jars of clay. That's what we are. But we're loaded with the kingdom. Watch us and bring glory to God. And now, here's the end. Different. Understand knowing. You see, when people out on the street, they see your acts of kindness, it brings glory to God. Look at this word discern. A lack of comprehension. That's Daniel chapter 12 and verse 10. The prophet didn't understand the dream that he was given. The wicked will never discern. They will never come to a knowledge of the truth. They will never understand us. That's discernment. Why do you hear the voice of the great shepherd? Why did you hear it? Nobody else did. Sitting in a room, sitting next to your best friend, sitting next to your wife, sitting next to your brother. Why did you hear it? You heard it. You heard it because He chose you before the foundation of the world. And he brought you to faith. He brought you to faith for a reason. You would bring glory and honor to Him. Now, 
Who can you do that to? Who will you do that to? This week, the poor you're always going to have. The weak you're always going to have. Who can you help? Who can you reach to? Who can you send a card to? Who can you pray for? This is our calling. Believer priest, be about our Master's business. And that's the proverb. Let's close. Um, thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. How grateful we are for the church, Believer's Chapel, for the elders, the deacons that are here, the ministry of the Word. How grateful we are for all that You have provided and given to us continually in Christ Jesus. Would You take this Word and sanctify Your people. Make them holy with it. That Jesus Christ, the King of heaven, the Lord of glory, would receive more and more honor by our efforts every day. Every day. Every day. In Jesus' name, Amen.